Hello, I'm Richard Litchfield, Chief Exec of Social Sector Consultants, Eastside Crime Times. And today I'm joined by Kate Lee, the head of the Alzheimer's Society. And we're going to be talking about financial resilience and particularly innovation and how charity leaders are trying to manage the changes that, um, the unprecedented changes that, that we're faced with. Uh, this video is part of a series on Building Back Better. Uh, where social sector leaders are sharing their tips and experiences for other social sector leaders. So you'll find it on ep-uk.org along with other support resources there. Kate, welcome. And let me start by asking you for a brief overview of the Alzheimer's Society today. Oh, it's really weird. I don't think anybody's asked me that question. This is the first time I'll be saying this as chief exec. Isn't this weird? I've been here eight months. Um, so that's that's very telling. So Alzheimer's Society is a charity which um, works with people with all forms of dementia and their carers. We work right from research, so looking at options around cure through to early diagnosis, through to care and technology. We have a huge direct support delivery um, services, so a range of services working directly with families. And we also do a lot of policy and campaigning work, lobbying government. And then we've got our amazing Dementia Friends and Dementia Friendly Communities programme, which is working to kind of change the views of society towards people with dementia. So lots and lots of aspects to the organisation, big organisation, um, uh, big charity, uh, largely funded by voluntary donations, although some of our services are commissioned. But that's the kind of feel of the organisation. Great. And you, you took on the role, I believe, on March the 1st this year. I did. Uh, I did. And that's a, a, been an incredibly difficult, I guess, and challenging time to, to take on a new leadership role. So what has been the experience of, of doing that within this global pandemic? I think it's been really interesting, Richard. I think there's been some real challenges of taking over a new organisation. So I only actually got to spend three days uh, kind of physically in the organisation before um, lockdown, which meant that... Uh, I haven't even met the whole of my executive team in person yet, uh, which I think is has been really challenging. And I think addressing some of the issues that I've wanted to address, I think induction is very complicated when you kind of can't get out and see teams and meet teams and meet service users and see them receiving services and get that real feel for the organisation and how it operates on the ground. I haven't been able to visit our research centres um, and we've had a lot of staff furloughed, so over 400 staff furloughed right uh, back since April. So um, I think it has been really, really challenging to take on a new job in this period. Having said that, then I think there's some been some advantages because it's a fresh pair of eyes. I think I don't know the history of a lot of how things are formed and why they're formed like they are. So in the terms of that kind of real agility, I think that's maybe in some ways been easier for me to kind of look at things afresh and say, well, why would we do that that way? Does that need to continue? Could that change? You know, just introducing some different thinking around kind of strategy. Um, we've created a bridging plan for this kind of 18 months period, which is kind of abandoning the strategy we had but not creating a new one yet we've just created a kind of interim piece with some four kind of key objectives for this period and I I think being uh, one of the advantages of being new is I've been able to do a lot of that really quickly because um, I can just do it on the perceptions of what I see I keep saying that I think if I'd have been at click sergeant my last role and I was having to make really deep cuts into our service delivery. It would be like kind of ripping my own heart out, given that I've absolutely seen how those services are needed and were integral to setting them up and growing them. And, uh, you know, just being completely honest, maybe there's some advantages of being new in an organisation where you, you can just look at things fresh. So that's really helped. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Kate. And can you give us a sense of the changes that you're now, you know, having to make in light of the financial outlook of, uh, for all fundraising charities at the moment. When we went into lockdown and then kind of early April, like everybody, we're just doing that big financial assessment. Um, we thought kind of worst case scenario this year was we'd lose around 40 million, which is about 50 percent of our voluntary income. So our turnover is about 110 million and um, about 30 percent, uh, about 30 million of that, roughly 25 to 30 million of that is commissioned income and the rest is, is voluntary. So of the kind of roughly 80 million voluntary, half of that we, we thought would go. 
uh, an organization that's relatively events heavy, things like our memory walk, very well known, but obviously all cancelled, our glow walks cancelled, we generate a lot of income off London Marathon. Um, so like lots of charities, got quite a big corporate partnership, lots of corporate partnership income coming in, worried about employees just not being in work, generating those funds. So um, actually our emergency appeal did incredibly well. Uh, it generated over four and a half million. I think the public have been incredibly understanding about how hard hit both elderly people in general, but particularly people with dementia have been through this period. So one in four people that have died with COVID had a dementia diagnosis. Mm. People with dementia have been the hardest hit of any group, both in the death rates and in massive significant decline, uh, kind of living in isolation is practically impossible when you have dementia. Um, without really deteriorating very quickly, you need a lot of social interaction to keep up all your skills like speaking. You know, um, people with dementia tend to keep those routine, th those things going through routine of doing them regularly. And if you're not doing them regularly, you lose those skills. It's very hard to get them back. So, yeah, for us, we kind of went with a planned approach. We started to make financial cuts to match that expenditure loss very quickly. We went with a contingency plan. So we identified three stages. We took out 12 million pounds of expenditure immediately. So we furloughed 400 staff right at the very start of the scheme. I think we were in there almost on the first day of the scheme. Um, we looked at closing as many properties as we could temporarily. Um, like many, you know, travel costs kind of cut themselves almost, etc. So we took about 12 million pounds of expenditure out immediately. We stopped things like our Dementia Action Week, a lot of our conferences, just things that we knew we could cut or bubble wrap, as I kept saying, like, what can we bubble wrap to unbubble wrap when we need to unbubble wrap them? So uh, pack them away safely, I think was the phrase that was being used a lot. So something stopped, something's got packed away safely. Um, we then identified another 10 million, so between 12 million and 22 million that we needed to work over the course of the year on taking out. So sadly, that has meant that we've um, lost about 320 colleagues through redundancy and we have closed about another 80 vacancies that we have been holding over since the middle of last year for, for various reasons. Um, so about 400 posts have gone out of the organisation headcount, about 300 FTE closure of properties so we own 102 properties and we're looking at closing 87 of them and that was really to kind of bring money in uh, we've also stopped all onwards going all forward looking um spend on research uh completely but we hadn't reneged on any of our current research spending and then we identified a third box which was called the turn the lights box off of the contingency plan which is what team keeps switches the light switch off so that was kind of a gradual plan of how we would work backwards to effectively, if worst case scenario, wrapping the organization up financially uh, and made some really tough decisions about things like our policy lobbying and campaigning team would be the last team to go because uh, even if we couldn't deliver direct services, we need to make sure that people with dementia had a voice. Um, luckily, our fundraising has really held up. It's done really well. We're now projecting that we'll lose between 27, 22 and 27 million which it feels the most random thing to say that that's good news. <laughs> but it's good news compared to the original 40. Uh, the fundraising team have done amazingly. Our corporate supporters have been particularly generous. Um, we've had the most fantastic support. So for us, we've actioned all box one and box two of our plan. Box three, our turn the lights off plan. So far, Titchwood, we haven't needed to touch on. And I kept saying that would be cutting into the muscle of the organisation. So that might be um, stopping year five spend on year on a on a five-year research program and we would lose all the work done in years one to four that would be a dramatic decision <laughs> but that would what we would have to do if we turn the lights off so i think that's how we planned it out financially and not had to touch the last box thank goodness good and I, I, I love that uh, bubble wrap idea image yeah i'll certainly hold on to that one um can you talk a bit about the process that, that you used? Again, obviously doing it remotely, um, different from how it how you'd have done it in the past. What were the key things that you did to deliver that restructure? Some work had started before I came on a restructuring of the workforce. So some of that was we just kind of 
um, picked that up and kind of spe- you know, speeded that process up. And obviously, where teams were uncertain about how to structure, there was a kind of new uh, imperative to take costs out as much as you could. So that um, we kind of took those plans and kind of I don't, boosted them, uh, I suppose, really up to cover off um, the organisation. We um, knew that we would have a significant number of people affected. So we went for a full 45 day consultation, but it meant that we started our, um, our work on that restructuring quite early. So we were really through that consultation and the majority of the staff that sadly needed to leave us had done so so by late August, uh, early September, which I think is maybe a little ahead of some other organisations. But as I say, there were already some plans in place about thinking about workforce planning, which helped. Um, And I think some of the key things that we've done, like many colleagues, we've tried to really up uh, consultation across the organisation. I made a commitment to staff that this wasn't going to be easy, but I would treat them like adults. We would tell them the difficult messaging with the positive. I think there's a huge amount for us all at the moment about just feeling out of control of our lives, you know, and I think that's for all of us, not just in work, but but certainly outside work as well. Um, having got a text on Saturday randomly telling me I need to self-isolate for nine days, I was like, whoa, how come so many other people are telling me what to do? Um, so I think what's been really important for me is focusing on trying to give people enough information to kind of have some control over the decisions they want to make about their future, um, which is about telling them about financial situation. As I say, we've really got to a place where we've stabilized our income and expenditure at about 27 million less than we were on this time last year. But trying to keep those messages going with people. I haven't sugarcoated those messages to staff. I know sometimes that's not landed well um and and you know there's lots of frustration we've had to do we're thinking a lot about our kind of who's going to work from home permanently going forward you know what does that mean and you know those are difficult decisions we've got a large workforce of people who are out delivering dementia support services face to face that haven't been able to do that for several months are very keen to know when they'll be back to that work um, so it's just a really frustrating time, I think, for lots of people. Restructures, uh, uh, clearly they're really painful to, to, to do and you, you're losing staff, treasured staff in the organisation, but they do also give you an opportunity to do things, do things differently. What changes the restructure might allow you to make to improve things? Yeah, I mean, I think we've been able to have a pretty radical review of a lot of kind of groups that we've got I mean, outside of kind of purely staff restructuring, I think restructuring the organisation and thinking about our strategy, I think it's created a good opportunity for us to think about things like we're involved in a huge amount of groups of kind of forums, membership bodies, you know, some of which we've been paying fees into for a long time, but probably not really accessed or used a lot that we a lot of residual groups and bodies that we chair that maybe have lost their way a little bit over the years but have run on and on because they just exist you know and there's no clear point in time in which to say is this forum still needed um so we've been able to kind of have a bit of a sort out of a lot of those things and I know it sounds quite a small thing but that's about for me it's really important to not just look at the organization's finances but also the organization capacity so quite a lot of discussion about saying you can't take 400 people out of an organization and not think about the core operating model of the organization and what matters and what are people spending their time on and what of that is going to go. Um, So some of that's been really useful to kind of focus on some of those things. I think we've been able to think about, it. maybe it's been quite freeing and being able to think about things differently. So um one small example our dementia friends groups um we've got coordinators for our dementia friends training we've got local volunteers working across the whole of the uk training people in dementia friends which is fabulous but often there's quite a bit of duplication between that work and the work of our regional and community fundraisers because for example we might be in a school one week with a volunteer training you know school children on dementia friendly uh, you know how to be dementia friendly what dementia is, why grandma might be poorly, why she might be repeating herself, you know, what's going on there. 
And then the following week, we might have community fundraisers back in the same school asking if they would be interested in supporting us with a fundraising activity. And the way that we'd operated previously, they would be completely separate teams and wouldn't even necessarily know that that had happened. So we've used this as an opportunity to, to move our dementia-friendly communities and our dementia friends into our fundraising directorate and our fundraising kind of engagement directorate. We're not necessarily making Dementia Friends a fundraising product, but we are getting real efficiencies on saying, actually, can those community fundraisers coordinate the work for schools? You know, can we train fundraisers in how to deliver some Dementia Friends training? Can we have some of our Dementia Friends, do they know what the opportunities are to engage in fundraising? So I think some of those changes people always want to make, but you, they're, they're difficult changes and you never quite get around to making them. So so we've used some of this opportunity to drive some of that. Thanks, Kate. I, I remember uh, reading something you wrote about innovation and I think you commented that there'd been, more, there'd been more innovation in the charity sector in like six weeks than there had been in, in six years. And so I thought we could just maybe finish the conversation today on, on thinking about that. And uh, do, do you have any kind of tips or ideas for other people in your situation around how they can use the current situation to take promising ideas, run with them and implement them? I think there's been fundamental level shift in kind of attitudes across the sector over the last seven months. Um, I think I was, I have mentioned this before, but I think I went into the um, lockdown quite nervous that it felt a little bit like uh, all eyes were on each other for the first big charity to go under you know and, and everyone was like oh just let it not be me and actually I think that's really shifted I think there's been really genuine collaboration and care for each other across the sector and I think that creates a really amazing opportunity for innovation that to resolve some of the issues that I think have gone on for a long time uh, you and I Rich, talked about many of those but for <laughs> Be able to really say, look, why are we genuinely duplicating this thing? You know, now neither of us can afford one. Shall we just have one? And I think um, I think it's like, because there's been a seismic shift, I think it's worth going back to lots of the problems that have been in the too difficult box, because I just think some sides have come down on that box. Um I think actually pro things that just people were not up for going there, whether that is about mergers, whether that's about sharing a backroom staff, stuff that's been too difficult before. Well, the risk tolerance has gone up significantly around those things. The, the benefits now will outweigh the risks on many of them because let's, let's be honest, we're all desperate for the resources and the capacity that they'll release. So, so I think my tip is just to kind of go back to some of those innovations we've all had over the years that have just come to naught because it's just been too difficult. And at the end of the day, the board hasn't been up for it or it's felt like too big a risk or the downside has felt significant. Actually, I think a lot of those downsides have changed. So I think for me, that would be my tip is just to not necessarily, it's not necessarily new innovation. It's a bit dusting off some of the things people have wanted to do for a while. I love that, Kate. Thanks. Solve the, the too difficult box. I think it's a great, great piece of wisdom. And uh, that's all we've got time for. So thank you so much. I really enjoyed thank the conversation. You. Brilliant as always to talk and uh, keep going. Thanks for all the work you're doing. Yeah, speak soon, Richard. Thank you. Bye.